Thank y'all for tuning in to the NFL Player Second Acts podcast. I'm one of the hosts, Peanut Tillman. And as always, I got my homeboy with me. First off, this dude, he's actually younger than me, but he looks older than me. My guy, my homie, Roman, second term Barack Obama Harper. You know what? Thank you, Peanut, for that great introduction. The best thing about today's guest is that um, I know I look old because of my gray hair and everything like that, but this yeah. brother looks older than me. I'm telling you, dog. He, he look Isaac Hayes old. <laughs> <laughs> so, Roman, you can't get that one, bro. You yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. I don't know. Mal, first of all, here we go. Let me introduce you first. Let me give you a couple of your accolades. Let me let me give you your flowers real quick. Read off this resume. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. Here we go. So my boy, all right, number first round draft pick to the New Orleans mm-hmm. Saints in 2009. First DB taken. What was it, 15 overall? 14. 14 14th overall. 14th overall from the Ohio State University. My boy, my dog. Omega Sci-Fi's finest, Malcolm Jenkins, 13-year NFL vet, two-time Super Bowl champion. He won Super Bowl 44 with none better than myself and a host of other great Saints players. Won Super Bowl 52 with the Eagles in 2018. He is the co-founder of the Players Coalition with the NFL. He's a businessman. He's a debonair. This guy does it all. He's a philanthropist, a Harvard fellow, an activist, and so on and so forth. I can keep going. All I do is learn from this guy every time I see each other. And now that he's retired, we're actually a lot cooler. We got so much more in common now. Malcolm Jenkins, welcome to the podcast, bro. I appreciate you guys having me. Big Jack, what's going on, boss? You look like you at uh, your offices right now, man. Where you at? No, I'm actually at Parkway Parkway Northwest High School in Philadelphia. I just got done um, talking to them. We just launched this uh, financial literacy program here through my foundation. So, uh, y'all are catching me in transition, man. I'm I'm always always busy. See this the school bell right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was perfect. In case so, are you having, so are you having lunch up there? You know, everybody know the the cafeteria lady. All we got is mashed potatoes and cone. So are you gonna eat some so, cafeteria food? I'm gonna food? be honest. I used to take. So my parents just give me like, uh, ooh, I was I was balling. So I think they gave me like four dollars for lunch, ooh. and I would spend. Three dot three dollars, I'll get cookies. And then the other, I'll get some French fries. That was that was all I ate in high school. Three cookies, fries, and French fries. fries. Dude, fries I went my I went a whole semester in junior high, bro, taking all my lunch money my parents gave me, saving it up for some shoes, like just snacking for like just snacking six in. months, dog. Just, just like, fasting on the grass <laughs> for these Jordans. <laughs> fasting. <laughs> just like it was so bad. But I, I get it, bro. I totally get yeah. it. So tell me this though, because I would not. I mean, is it a private school or a public school? Because public, public school, school. Lunch is probably a little bit Always different. Always public yeah. school. Yeah, yeah. I went private to one school. private school early, like from pre-K to second grade. It was a there's an all black was an all black private school called Chad School in uh, Newark, New Jersey. Like, imagine Wakanda University. Like, that's what it. <laughs> That's what it was, and it was like it was awesome. We talk to talk to our. Uh, we wouldn't say like miss or mrs it'd be uh brother johnson or sister <laughs> sister penny that's what they was being taught right on. Oh, black national anthem every morning like that's dope that's yeah dope. it was that's awesome dope. that was the only private school i've been to everything else is public oh that's, that's so cool though. so All where right. did you just now you just came from yeah. somewhere right you just i know you just came from vacation right i know you you were in europe you traveled a couple of places oh, tell me about well, that yeah yeah it wasn't vacation i was just at the um one of the things I've been trying to do to stay away from the game is like find some other hobbies and uh, art is something I've always been around, but like trying mm-hmm. to take it more serious <laughs> about collecting. And so uh, I was out in uh, London uh, at Freeze, the art fest out there. That was my first time going to that. It was amazing. Nope. amazing. Then caught a train and went to Paris um, to check out another artist that I really love. One of my favorite artists, his name is uh, Tabar Strachan out of um, the Bahamas. Phenomenal mm-hmm. artist doing some great stuff. He had these, this this sculpture of Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz. Yeah. Obviously, you know, that that struck a chord with me, but it's just phenomenal. Put it in the, in the way of Michelangelo. It's awesome. So, 
I mean, so Mal, I, I know you've, I've been to your place in New Orleans, your new place. And so you have art all over the things. And I, I know, like, how has art become your passion? Uh, I want you to kind of go into that. Me and you talk about these things all the time. You know, you are always trying to, you know, keep your mind going and things like that. But how has art really just taken off in your own? Um, well, I think I like anything that has this, like to do with storytelling. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, I grew up around art. So my aunt's an artist. So I've, I saw paintings on the walls like as early as I can remember. My earliest memories, I saw you know these these paintings. I remember um, you ever saw the Sugar Shack Eddie, Eddie, uh, Eddie Barnes? It's the it's the um, it's the uh, Marvin Gaye album cover. Um, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sugar Shack. I saw that pic that painting on my wall from as early as I can remember. My aunt did a cover of it. I thought it was her painting for the longest until I got older. <laughs> and learned about who Ernie Barnes was, a former NFL player that turned artist and is now one of the like goats of, you know, black artistry. But it's just the idea of being able to, to think about something and articulate it and express it in a way um, that might be nuanced. You know, so we sit here and we were exposed only to sports uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, outlets where if we want to talk about these other things, we're at the mercy of like the, the writer or the journalist who's, you know, it has an agenda, but being able to express yourself in ways that aren't always with words. So whether it's your fashion, whether it's film, um, music, art, like all of those things to me are just storytelling. And right. when I get to sit with an artist and they break down why they used this material, uh, you know, like we'll say, oh, this is trash. And it's like, exactly. They use trash specifically to tell this narrative. Mm -hmm. Like, and all of those things to me, once you understand it, like, change how you value it and mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're attached to these pieces because they speak to a narrative it's like listening to a good song when a writer says something that like he articulates the feelings that you had but you could mm -hmm. never like put it like that yeah. it's the same thing with art once you learn how they're doing it you're like i could never make that or do that in that way and it's so interesting that they took that that narrative and perspective on whether it be sculpture or abstract paintings all of that now, do you do any artwork yourself, though, being that you are a fan of it? Can you, can am, you paint? Can you draw? Can you sculpt? Can you? No, no I can't draw. paint, can't draw, can't <laughs> sculpt. But what I have started to figure out is like, yeah, like, all right, well, what are, and this is what I think is important, like for every black man, this is one thing that we don't do, is we need like some creative outlet, like mm -hmm. in general. And so one of the things I started to do um, was photography. Like I just picked up a camera, showed myself how to do it. Um, and so, you know, I'll go out, I'll take pictures, edit them, taught myself how to do it. And I have a, like a photo wall, all of them, like mm -hmm. my own stuff. And I'm working on some things, you know, here or there, but you got to learn kind of the basics. And I'm like, I'm not going to put nothing out there or right. it might just be only for me to see. It's just my own little private thing. But yeah, I, I think I am looking for ways to like, the more you get around it, you, you start to learn how they do it. Yeah. Okay, you play around with it, dabble a little bit, but I'm not going, I'm no artist, but. What's, what's one of the best pieces you've taken to date? Hmm. I got, I can send it to you too. I got this picture. I was in Morocco mm -hmm. and I uh, went through the markets in uh, Madrid and, um, and you, I think, yeah. And you go into it. This is guys with snake charmers and stuff. This guy he takes a snake and he's like dra like draping it like over his face and he's like kissing it. I took a picture of it like real close, like edit up. It's like phenomenal. Like it's like <laughs> my favorite picture that I've taken. I was like, okay. Everybody who comes and sees it, they're like, like, like oh, who took that? And I'm like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I like to um I like I like to check that piece out. Send it to uh, Rome or whatever. Yeah, I got you, dog. So Mal, now that you're back in the states, you went on vacation. You're enjoying yourself. You're going all over. I, I know most of these places, but so what have you been up to, dog? I mean, I know I know the girls back in school. So what you up to? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I've been um, half of my time is just being dad. Like I'm at mm -hmm. home. I'm, I'm in the school drop off lines. I'm in the pickup line. Soccer. Oh, practice. tell them how you cooking it up, too, because I, I, I've been over there. And you was cooking dinner. Dog. It oh, nice. yeah. Nah, it's a full time <laughs> job. Yo. Like, you know. I'm a single dad with no nanny. So I got two girls. I'm like, we up at in the morning, breakfast, uh, clothes to, to school. I get my little work in, you know, work out, do whatever I got to do between them. Then it's pick up and it's like clockwork. You know, you pick them up. Here's a snack, change L, get to soccer practice. 
get home, homework. While they doing homework, I'm cooking dinner. Get dinner. We got about 30 minutes to chill, watch something, and then they sleep. <laughs> and hey, how old are your kids? They're eight and uh four. Eight and four. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's the majority of my life, about half of the month. And then the other half of the month, um, um either doing some of the things that I enjoy. So it's like the art stuff or it's bouncing around. And then a couple of smaller gigs, like just talking about the game of ball, little podcast stuff here or there. Um, but yeah, working on more creative stuff um, than anything else, to be honest. So after eight months of retirement, bro, you watching football. Mm-hmm. Do you miss it? Do you have Not any urge to play Not again? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I had one urge. I went to my first game, finally. Uh um, Saints versus uh, Raiders. And in pregame, I was like, okay. Yeah, it's the pregame. That's really it, though. I was like, I could I could almost feel my pads on my body. I was like, yeah. I'm ready. Yeah, like, yeah, I could play. I could play right now. But after that, like, nah, I really, I really have not had any, like, second guesses or thoughts of, like, playing the game. I actually enjoy this vantage point of being a fan and, like, and having no control over what's happening. Yep. Makes it, like, the anxiety of that, like, the tension in the moments. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. You know what's real funny, Matt, was that I didn't know how hard it was being a fan. Like, like you just mentioned about the anxieties. Like, when you have no control, it's way worse. Like, it's being terrible. a fan is it's way terrible. worse. It's terrible. <laughs> Being just on the field, like you only control, you're only just concerned with your job. You're like, bro, I'm just trying to. I don't have time to be worried about none of that. I I have so man. much. I'm such a fair weather person as a fan. Like I'm in the first quarter, like yo, they down, they down 14. It's over with, yo. This game is done. <laughs> I like as a player, I was the guy that was always like, man, we can always come back. Like this is nothing. super, super positive, super positive, no matter what. Optimistic all the time. As a fan, I'm like, this is <clears throat> this is the first quarter. This is over with. All right. So when did you know? It was time to retire because you we had talked about it, but I didn't know you was going to pull the trigger. And when you did, it was just like no hesitation, almost like your tweet game. Yeah. Right. I mean, it got easy, yo. I'm gonna be honest. It just got easy. And it's like um, it's taking up too much time. It's like a lot going on, like from family life. Like, yo, you sacrifice a lot of it. Like, mm-hmm. I want to spend more time with my family. I want to spend more time doing all these things. But like and football has taught me so much, mm-hmm. like. You learn, like, literally to be a professional in the game, like the nuances of the game. Like, it takes a certain skill level to get there. And then you start to realize that, like, if I apply this, these same tools to anything else in life, yeah, I'm going to succeed. Like, it's we know how to we know how to build teams. We know process. We know discipline. Like, we understand evaluation. We know how to deal with failure, how to come back from failure, how to stay focused in success. Like these are all things that people in the real world struggle with. CEOs and and people who build businesses don't have these tools. And we've been doing this since me personally since I was seven. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, it almost started to feel like like football is what I love, but it's not what I'm built to do. And, right. And everything that I'm built to do is like pulling on me, like it's calling me. And the game of football really just got easy. Roman, I remember you told me this when I was young. And I was trying to learn how to play strong safety. I'm like, man, how you know how how do you read so fast if it's running past? And he was like, I'm like, what are you looking at? He was like, I, I mean, it's a feel. He's like it just it just sound different. And I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? He's like, man, you just feel the game after a while. And it's like, okay. And then probably two, three years later, like I reached that point where like I would feel the game. And it was like, oh, and I kind of knew it was never like the last two years I played, I was not nervous at all for any game. Yeah. And it was like, okay, it's probably time. I've done everything I needed to do. I can still play. I love competing, but it's like, I'm, I'm cheating people. You know me, Roman. I'm an all in type of person. Thousand percent. Like all in. If you, if you got me here. And so, and if I can't be like that, it's like, then it's probably time for me to move to something else. I was probably smart. Um, it's, it's funny that you say the whole, uh, the, the the nervous and I think one of the unique things though about the way you retired is you did it on your term like yes. you did it most people don't retire when they're ready it's either they didn't get picked up or they got injured and that was it I was kind of the the guy that got injured because I still wanted to play but after I tore my ACL in Carolina my last year I was like man I'm going on like 34 35 I just tore my ACL I think I'm gonna have to call it a day because uh, no one's trying to to pick up an, an old guy. 
And you also said something, um, <clears throat> how Rome, when you were younger, Rome really took you under his wing and he told you and, you know, gave you some, some, some great advice. What has Rome taught you that you're kind of using today, right now? Roman taught me a lot in leadership. Mm -hmm. um, That's and... crazy to say, because Malcolm was the captain. Like, I, I hated this <laughs> stuff. Like, I was never, it, it, that's crazy to me to hear that, but I was always like, well, I, don't, I don't need all that stuff. Go ahead, Malcolm, sorry. Um, and not leadership in like, like I'm gonna stand in front of the entire room, mm -hmm. but like man-to-man mm -hmm. -man leadership. Yeah, like, like, he got okay, that old like, man wisdom. Like I've seen like, okay, when Tracy Porter is, you know, our main corner, he's our guy. And then he's just late one too many times. So we're like, like at first it's like, we don't care. You know, the coaches can care what they want. But now it's like, oh, you do something that now it's like a player only me. And then you, you're, you're too late. Like instead of being a thing where most of us know how to call people out in a big room, mm -hmm. you do that. Cause you got backup. You got other people to like to, to jump on as well. But like I'm just watching, and he'll hang back and be like, "Hey, Tracy, let me like stay here." And then to have a man-to-man -man conversation about like, "Oh no, like we need more out of you." And and Roman's not the captain. He's not like the dude with the C on his chest. He's not the. And it's like, oh, the ability to meet people like where they are, understanding who's who. Yeah. And then uh, and then when I got to Philadelphia, um, like I was like that guy, and I started to realize a lot of the stuff that Roman used to say to me, um, I had to say to to Rodney uh, McLeod. He was a young dude, just like me, came through Greg Williams defense. So super cerebral, like we spoke the same language, but he thought he knew everything and would want to question the coach on everything. Like, you're not perfect. You're going to ask the coach every single question. And I remember Roman used to tell me, it's like, bro, coach. And then Crime Dog was our DB coach. Our last, my last year in New Orleans. And they said, bro, you're clearly smarter than everybody. That's fine. But like for this meeting to go, like you can't disrupt the meeting. Like you want to do this on your own time, go upstairs with them early, like on Tuesday and get all of that out before we get to the meeting on Wednesday, because the other people are not learning. Like the guys who don't know what you know, aren't learning because you like, it's causing confusion. And I'm like, okay, fine. Like I finally shut up and just like, okay, learn how to, to do it in a different way. And when I got to Philly, I was able to, to, to talk to Rodney about those things because I had been through it. And I just bust out right. laughing. Rodney said all the same things that I was saying. And it's like, okay, uh, I'm prepared for this. <laughs> it's funny how growth changes you though. You know what yeah. I'm saying? How it, how we're prepared. Rome was the same way in Philly or excuse me, not Philly in Carolina. Like he didn't have to tell me nothing. Cause I was, I think I was the oldest vet at the time so when I got there. So I, I had kind of knew how to play. I knew the room. I didn't really say a ton, I let Rome do his thing because it was I was a new guy, but the old guy, my job was more lead by example. I'm not I'm not the talker. I'm not. I know cats ain't finna listen to me. I, I don't have the Ray Lewis. I'm not. That's not who I am. And I didn't try to fake it. Mm -hmm. I would say something dumb or funny. That was me. I was I, I would crack jokes all the time, saying stuff inappropriately all the time. That was totally all the time, me. all the time. Zero <laughs> filter. Time. Proudly admit it. Yeah. But Rome would do that with you did that with Benet. Trey, uh, Jano, Josh Norman, like he was, I think Rome was, again, were you a captain in Carolina? No, no. Yeah, wasn't a captain in Carolina, but he was the, I guess because you had all that great, they just kind of looked right, up just to like, you. Right, it's just like, he gotta be, he gotta like, have you just, just like, there. yo, he's, he's, he's like that old, the old guy off of the show Kung Fu, you know, like, they just always would flock to Rome for some of that old school advice, and it was just like, yeah, and they used to call him Unk, too. Yeah, yeah. They, they was like, still hey, do. Yo, unk. Hey, yo, they OG. Still do. Hey, unk, unk. Hey, yo, unk, OG. Lou, Lou Young. Yeah, let, yeah. Listen, now, now that we gave Rome some flowers, let me like, let me, let me put some parameters back on this. Now, this that was the one example that I had. I was like, Roman was also the reason why I didn't get along with a lot of coaches because he didn't <laughs> walk into the room. I'm like, it was. I'm a young guy. I'm a rookie. Rome's probably what? I hope years. you go tell me this. I hope you tell him this story. This is like the best one ever. Yeah. Fourth okay. year, fifth year player, something like that. And he's like a fourth year player. And you know, coaches are nitpicking on like little things. We're we're undefeated in my rookie year. We're like 10 and 0. And the coaches are still trying to like, you didn't set the edge right here like you're supposed to on the numbers. You set it out here. It's like, bro. And they're giving him, they gave him a bad grade. Like, and he had a ball, he balled out and got like a, a bad grade. So now Roman's mad. And then uh, D D Dennis Allen, the, the head coach now of the Saints, said he was DB coach. And he said something 
like slick. And Roman was just like, man, y'all just, I'm just saying y'all here nitpicking. He's like nitpicking. He's like, get, he's like, you say it all the time. This is a, this game is played by players. Coaches just coach. I said, Ooh, I'm in the back of the room. Like, what you going to say? Coach didn't say nothing else after that, but it was like, he was also that guy. Yeah. Rome didn't watch film. He was fucking playing video games. <laughs> he got his, he, he playing Call of Duty all day. I was like, yeah, this is, this is Roman Harper. Gray hair does not mean wisdom. They just assumed that when he got to Carolina. <laughs> 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 well, he definitely he definitely had it though, because I'm not gonna lie, he used to put the old schools. You and Kurt, I would meet y'all in the morning, and that's Kurt, how we yeah. would watch film. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's true professional, and it sounds like I think one of the biggest jumps that rookies don't have is learning how to be a professional when they mm-hmm. go from college to the NFL. And it always takes, for the most part, an older guy, a veteran, to to give the younger guy some tips, some advice on how to watch film, how to practice how to eat, how to take care of your body, treatment, so on and so forth. Um, Malcolm, what would what would your advice be to NFL players and or athletes in general just about being a professional? Uh, I mean, you know, any, every time you come into this game, you want to play it as long as you can, right? right? And there are certain things that, like, will help you last in the game that have nothing to do with football. Professionalism True. is one of them, like – the ability, like they tell you all the time, accountability and availability are like two of the major things when it comes to teams evaluating players. You can be as talented as you want, but if I can't hold you accountable, or I don't think that you can just do your job um, and you're not healthy, then no matter what your talent is, you can't, I can't use you. Right. Um, and so it's really just about um, coaches are always evaluating you. Like it's not just on the field. It's right. how you walk around the building. It's do you take notes? Do you make new mistakes? Are you a repeat mistake offender? Like all these things have nothing to do with like how well you tackle, how well you catch the ball. It's how you how you um, hold yourself and carry yourself and and improve yourself. Coaches are not that good in the NFL. I'm like, I know this is a podcast for this, but I don't believe that coaches <laughs> are that good. It's like how much has how many coaches have actually taught you like a new technique that took Mm. you to the next level as a player. A lot of it is self-governance, right? Like if Mm -hmm. I mess up, I got to stay up to practice and improve myself. The coach is only teaching me what to do on third down, what to do on first and second down, red zone. That like real improvement comes on your own in the off season. It comes on your own in your own time. Your preparedness for the game comes on your own time. All of that stuff. You don't think the coaches help you learn the game though, in in a sense? Maybe not technique, but just like learning the game itself. Some like. some do, but I would yeah. say out of the amount of coaches, I played for six coordinators. Mm-hmm. Under that, you had like different, you know, DB coaches. I didn't learn a game from the majority of them. I probably learned the game from like Greg Williams, um, Jim Schwartz, um, Rob Ryan I learned a game from. And then uh, Corey Unlin was a, a DB coach that I had in, in Philadelphia who could have been a, a D coordinator. Um, and then Dennis Allen, I did learn some football from him, like some stuff. But like you're not learning how to that. None of the stuff I was learning was helping me cover Calvin Johnson. Agree. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I, I think I think I learned more from players, from like players. other players from their mistakes. Like, exactly. yeah, like <laughs> learning from their mistakes. And then you using like what they have taught me or technique where my eyes. Maybe I, when you see this, you know, like one of the things was, man, when you're inside leverage, bro. And they're going on an out route. They're just going to roll into it. They're not going to try and set you up when you're inside leverage, you know. But if you're inside and they want to get inside, they're going to try and do something to get you to move to go. Like that's the things I'm like. Oh, I never actually thought about that. Makes sense. Yeah. Like, but these are guys that tell you. The coaches don't tell you that. Guys that have played. It. Yeah, they don't know it. They, don't they, know, it. they know the paper. They like <laughs> they are telling you what's on this paper. The paper yes. says in cover three. Hey, you're supposed to play outside leverage. Okay, cool. <laughs> So I can do that because if he's way out here, why would I ever do that? I would like every so can't play everything the same. And those nuances I've learned more from players and doing it myself than I have from coaches. And and the professionalism is like understanding that that's your responsibility. Like that is not it's not the coach's responsibility. I mean, technically it is, but nobody cares at the end of the day. Like right. on Sundays, like you being prepared, being healthy, and being ready to perform, they're going to look at you 
yeah. <laughs> for that responsibility. They're not looking at the coaches uh, on that. And those who can do it consistently tend to stay around longer. Yeah. All right, now, you want the next one, Peter? Go ahead, brother. No, go for it. Go for it. So I, I'm just going to throw it out there, Mal. What's it like to own a sports team, bro? Uh, I mean, let's let's calm down here, guys. Uh, it's stressful. So I was minority owner in Burnley Football Club. Um, we were in the Premier League last year and uh, got relegated. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So it was rough. It was it was in dramatic fashion too. It came down to like the last match of the year. It's going back and forth. Uh, yeah, we got rele- relegated. We're in the Champions League, but uh, doing well. You're talking about soccer, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Premier, yeah. Was the Premier League soccer? Uh, not in the Champions League. Um, Burnley. Um, it's awesome though. I mean, you know, as athletes, you don't, we don't even imagine. It's like, I, I barely thought I was going to play in the NFL. Like I didn't even have dreams to do that. So to be in a position where you're like a mino- minority owner in a, in a uh, sports club in another country is just, that's, that's a big accomplishment for me and, and my team. And it's really just like, if I look at my businesses, I'm in so many different things, like mm-hmm. on purpose. Um, and just tell, being tell able us about to be, a couple of them. Tell yeah, I mean, so I'm I'm in everything from real estate to franchising. We own um, uh, half a over a half a dozen. I'm sorry, over a dozen uh, quick service restaurants, and getting ready to blow that to over thirty um, in the next two years. We've got a venture capital fund called Broad Street Ventures, doing um, investments into uh, growth and late stage companies. Um, that's been going well. Got my own production company. Um, uh, we just acquired and just uh, invested into one of the largest distilleries in Pennsylvania. So we've got the the spirits and all of that. We're all over the place, real estate um, and sports groups in, in, in sports is one of the things I also wanted to invest in being an athlete. Like we know, we know how valuable we are like as, as athletes in the sports. Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, how did how do, do we not invest into having some kind of equity into um, you know that sports space where we know athletes, we know how to build the brand, we know how to add value to an organization. Um, because I've had 13 years of professional experience, and even more when we go back to how long we've been playing ball. So how do you? I mean, I know you said you retired, you were done, and family time with the kids, and you gave us that whole schedule. Like, how do you have time to do all of this with all your businesses? Like uh, the business the side. The best thing I've ever done in my life was build a team mm-hmm. uh, while I was playing. Um, and so I figured out ways to, you know, most of us, when we come into the league, we are on a conveyor, conveyor belt, right? It's like, right. All right, get an agent, get a financial <clears throat> advisor, get all these people who they tell you you're supposed to have. Great. Um, I did that as well. And then eventually as I've gone along, I just started to realize like, all right, who's making money off of me and who can I replace? Like, how do they make money? It's like, well, oh, I've got a friend who can handle my finances. They do it for another company, you know? And get they're working a nine to five to do that same job for another company. I was like, well, as soon as we can build enough up together over here and we can afford to pay you full time, leave that and come do it for me. And then we'll build that. We have the franchising. Uh, Same thing with the uh, investments. Then it's the real estate. And so enable for like I know I can't do all these things alone. Right. So I'd rather share in the equity and then have other people join me and build it. And that's how I'm able to get into all these other things is that I'm just taking people and evaluating who I think is in the best position to really like uh, take off and run in that space. And I'm equipping them with the the capital, the leverage in in my social capital, like the doors that I can get into, I'm bringing them into that space to do that for me. Um, And I was able to do that while I was playing while I'm, you know, while everybody cares about who you are, they want to let you in the door. I'm just bringing my people with me. And yeah. then I retire. I'm sitting around a, a group of five people and we've got stuff that we can do on our own. Like we're not knocking down doors looking, you know, to go work for somebody else. We've got all of that in place and it's about just scaling it now. And that's yeah. that's the biggest thing. That's probably the best thing I've ever done. And you know, I gotta give him out. I gotta give him out credit because I remember, like, his rookie year, second year, he was telling me about these apartments he owned in Columbus. I'm like, what? You are in that? Credit. Yeah, I ain't gonna take credit for that. But but that was part of my team, though. Like, right. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. he was already doing these things at an early age where when you first come in, everybody's telling you, man, you gotta save, you gotta be smart, you gotta do this, and just focus. 
And Malcolm was already doing these things. That's why I, I just want to let him know that, man, this started forever ago. Like yeah. this, Malcolm's I've been really though. doing this. Yeah. I've been blessed. Like one of my my, my main partner in crime is uh, Valanda Johnson is her name. We've been tight since, we, well, I'm going to say tight. We've been friends since kindergarten. But we've known each other our entire lives. And she was the one, she was the one, literally the person I'm talking about that was working as an auditor for Johnson & Johnson. And it was like, yeah. uh, she's the one in 2010. I remember this is my second year, I made a bunch of, I was making $9 million that year. Um, and she's like, so what you going to do? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. And she's like, you need to be in real estate. You need to do this. And so I asked the question to my financial advisors, like, hey, can I get into real estate? And then that was the first deal they came with was an apartment building that I bought on credit. And then like a million dollar building I bought using credit that was already paying for itself. And so I'm like, I got this building without spending a dime of my money. Yeah. Only because somebody was smart enough to tell me, hey, these are the things you should be thinking about. Yes. Right, right. And because, and I didn't realize that, oh, my financial advisors would never give me that. <laughs> They're not giving you that. They, sorry, I'm at school guys, period changing. Next class. Yeah, because they don't get paid off of that. <laughs> they only get paid of what they invest, so they wouldn't do those things. So it's it's just even understanding the ecosystem. They used to tell us all the time, be the boss of your finances. And it's like, okay, but these people realistically don't work for me. Right. They work for the bank. Yeah. <laughs> the bank pays their salary, right? And so it's different, and there's conflict of interest there. And those are things that we just don't understand. And I've been blessed to have people around me that have made me challenge the way that things are done or made me think about these things in mm -hmm. different ways early enough that now here I am, I can walk away from the game because the decision for me in my retirement is like, mm, okay, is, can I walk away from the money? Yeah. And that really is what it like, that's the hardest thing. And I'm like, I don't ever want to be in a position where I'm afraid to walk away from money. And I feel like I got to be there only for it. And so that was like, okay, let's move. Uh, and, and luckily, I've been in a position where I can. Um, and, but like to Roman's point, though, that didn't start like two years ago. That's yeah. been that's been, been doing that for a minute. Yeah, that's yeah. what's up. That's what's up. So I know five years ago you started the the Players Coalition. Yeah. And I mean, you've been very vocal about kneeling national anthem how uh you know african americans how we could be and be more included in a, a, a lot of things and specifically police law enforcement just stuff that's happened around uh the united states within the last i don't know 10 15 years right mm -hmm. there's been this huge shift has the players coalition been going the way you felt it should I think it's been since going its on. creation. Yeah, since creation, I think I think the coalition has um, has honestly exceeded my <laughs> expectations tenfold. Um, nice. And so I think there's a misunderstanding about the coalition as well. Is that there that it's a program that's like underneath the NFL and it's right. not. <clears throat> These are two separate entities. The player coalition. What we did was do something that's never been done before. We looked at uh, a bunch of group of athletes that wanted to be socially engaged, wanted to use their platforms to have some real uh, impact in our, um, in our, the way our society is structured. Mm -hmm. And they had the idea to do that together. And they would create an organization that was completely uh, built by players and completely run by players. All of the decision-making comes from players that's separate from the union and separate from the league that will make these decisions on how we push the money that we got from the league. We decide where that money goes. We also build a, a organization that uh, a vehicle for players who now want to be involved. They don't have to, you know, try to their only option is not to push against their their team clubs and, and do these things in a locker room or on the field. Mm -hmm. They can contact us, get all the education they need, get all the resources they need. We can organize the events that they want, whether it be in their city or their hometown. Um, so that the work can continue. Mm -hmm. And and since then, we've expanded to not only just the NFL and, and the, it started with 12 NFL players and expanded to hundreds um, that have been engaged in our work. But we also expanded to 12 other um, professional sports leagues. So okay. that's WNBA, soccer, baseball, like all of these groups have now created their own uh, coalitions and they're underneath nice. our sister, our, like our we're the umbrella company to all of that. So our example and our resources have not have turned into not only work that we can do, that mm -hmm. is we've given away millions to grassroots organizations that do the work every day, 
but it's also catapulted uh, and empowered other athletes across different, you know, sports and, and, and sections to organize and, and use those resources. Now, how involved are you with the coalition at this point today? Yeah, I think I think uh, the way that we operate is a little bit different. I'm still very involved from uh, the mm-hmm. high level stuff. But what we recognize is that uh, politics and our impact is more regional, which is yeah. perfect for the way that athletes are. Right. Mm-hmm. We focus a lot on kind of these national debates and national conversations, but really the power lies state and local. And so is and that's where we're most powerful. Right. Is where our fan bases are. So I'm able to do so much work in Philly and get so much done in Philly that I can't do in Oakland, all right? Um, just because of that's I don't have fans there, I can't show up there co- consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, it's mm-hmm. been about the particular communities that you live in. How are you being engaged there? Um, and so for me, yeah, all my work is is focused on the Philadelphia area. That's kind of my yeah my, my territory. And then and then recruiting. Like, how do we get the next generation of leaders to take this up? Because Anquan Golden, you know, the co-founder, he retired in order to help us build it. And he built it up while I was still playing kind of the, mm-hmm. the voice of it all. Um, but now I'm retired. Right. And there is and, and times and circumstances are different. And so there is a need for this next voice, these next leaders to carry this out into the, the forefront, because there are a lot of important things that are happening um, socially in our communities uh, and in multiple communities that will need voices of athletes that will need a collective um, and no, but no better person to serve them than those next generation leaders. Right. So are the, I, I guess my question is to be in the coalition, do you have to be an active player or are there no. retired players? Oh, no, no, no. So, well, yeah, we, we're focused with athletes, but right. um, but it's we have both retired and active and, and it's really a spectrum of how you want to get involved. Like some and, and this is why we built it is like whatever you want to do. If mm-hmm. it's just, hey, I want to get information on what's happening in my city that I should be aware of or I want to, you know, sign on to a letter with some other people. Well, all I got to do is sign my name or I want to send a tweet. Or if you want to full out, like, I want to have a town hall and organize, you know, meetings with politicians, whatever it is you want to do, we can set that up for you. And that's that's what the coalition is, is a resource you. for mm-hmm. players to, to get active however it is they want. And how do they reach out to you to get those resources? Yeah, um, play, players, playerscoalition.org is the website's got all of our information, all of our programs the pillars and, and the things that we stand for. We're doing things in education and economic justice, criminal justice reform, uh, police and uh, community relations, like the, the whole gambit. So it's not right. even just like one thing. There's multiple topics you can get involved in. There's multiple levels. Um, and even if it's just, you just want information to figure out, like we just had an election. If you want to know information about the local candidates, you know, and what's going on in your city, you just need that we're a resource. Got you. Got you. So you've been extremely vocal your career. Were you always kind of like the, the the vocal guy or did was that something that you kind of had to grow into? Because I know lately, you know, politics, social justice and things like that, that's been a real big topic with the league. Yeah. And a lot of some players, I remember the whole anthem thing. Some people wanted to kneel. Some people didn't want to kneel. Uh, it it, it, it kind of was a a thing for a lot of teams where it was like, you know, black people wanted to do it. Some white people didn't want to do it. Some were offended. Some weren't offended. Some really didn't get it or understand it. And you have been extremely vocal, which Mm -hmm. I I applaud you for. I I applaud you for, uh, for, for being vocal and and, and speaking on that. How did you get into that role? Like, how did you get into like, you know what, I need to, I'm going to take a knee or I, I I need to stand up and I need to say something like, what did, where did that come from? Where did that, Mal- and you got the name Malcolm. So I, yeah, I feel yeah. like it, it, like where, where did that come from? That, and no, you got the egg? Bro, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was in brother, Jack, brother, yeah, Malcolm. brother, Jack. I mean, brother Malcolm. obviously like, like I've been, I've been raised obviously with a, with a very, um, um, detailed kind of history of just mm-hmm. like black people, what we are capable of and, kind of what we've been through. And and honestly, not even enough. Like for me, I, as an adult, I'm still on a journey of just learning kind of how we've arrived to where we are. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually a person who's very introverted and who does not like conflict. Um, but, so but, I'm, but I'm somebody so that true. like, when it's time, I'll do what needs to be done. And yeah. so when you see me 
raising my hand and, and being so loud and vocal, you have to understand that that's because I believe that this needs to be done. It's not what I want to be doing. I don't want to invite these, <laughs> this energy, this, this friction, but if it's, but if it comes down to like a, like on a football field, if I got to tackle this guy who's bigger than me, or I got to take on this pulling guard. Well, I'm going to find out, you'll see how much I love my teammates based yeah. on how I make that decision. And for me, I love my communities. I've been raised to, to love my family and the people that I come from. I have a lot of pride in it. And I have a lot of understanding that we as a people are not innately violent, stupid, uh, or inadequate. So when you look at those symptoms coming out of specific communities, you have to look at, well, what is causing that? If I don't believe that these people are just like that, then there are reasons that explain all of it. And if we right. can get to those reasons, then we'll get to the the core and stop trying to stop the the symptoms of it all. Um, and so for me, it just like any captain, sometimes you just got to stand out front, take the bullets just to keep this thing focused, keep everything going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, that was what was needed from not only me, like Colin Kaepernick obviously took a knee, mm -hmm. uh, Eric Reed and Mike Thomas. So you had voices all over the league that were really um, stepping up to the plate. And all of that, and I get my name gets attached to the coalition a lot, but it's a coalition, meaning right. there's a group of guys of that people. made decisions. There was a group of us yeah. that were in those negotiations, a group of us that made every decision that got us there. Right. Uh, you know, and and that to me is really like the most important part. Yeah. Brother Jank, y'all stay tuned. We're gonna we're gonna pay a couple of bills. We'll be right back. All right, we're back with me and my partner in crime, Peanut. Well, Charles, Peanut headed, Peanut Tillman punch, whatever. Come on, come on, come on. Do that again. That was so lame. Peanut headed. Your clowning skills are whack right now, bro. Like, you was, that was trash. You know what? That was SNL. That was not even Def Jam funny. That was like SNL funny. I need Def Jam funny. Okay. You would have got booed at the Apollo for that intro. Do that because I, I, went, I wasn't giving them all do my again. sauce. Do, do that again. Do that again. All right. You know what? Do that again. Three, two, one. All right. We're back after a little bit of commercial. We had to pay some bills. My man, Peanut Tillman, here with our guest today, Malcolm Jenkins. Brother Jank. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Brother Jank or Brother Malcolm, however you want to go for it. NFL Players Second Acts Podcast. Thank you again, Mal. We got a couple quick hitters for you. All right. First thing that comes to mind, be ready for it. Some of these questions are going to be challenging. Some of them are just all for giggles, bro. Just being honest yeah. with you. All right. Mm -hmm. You ready? Yeah. All right. What was the first thing you splurged on after you got drafted? Uh, the first thing I bought was a 2009 Mercedes S550. Oh yeah, the S class bins. I remember that bad color boy. Was still black. Color was <laughs> what color black. was it? It was all black. black. Yeah, all black everything. I love yep. it. Yep, stock right. rims, nothing. I ain't do nothing to it. All I did nothing. was take the windows. It had nothing nothing else to it. All right, I got nothing one else. for you. Uh, what was your What was your go to outfit for a prime time game? Uh, so I always had like so you know I got my own suit company, so I always shout had out a, have a yeah Damari, you know based out of Philly. So we uh so I always design something nice for the whole season. Like I have my whole seven weeks planned out or eight weeks at home. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hold okay. on. So you would, you would already have them laid out like first day of school. Like this is this week. This is this week. Oh this yeah. Before the season, I'm like, Hey, all right, this week we got a primetime game week three. I need to have some fire for that. Got this role game. Yeah. You know, you gotta, you gotta have it all. You gotta have a plan. Cause I'm not trying to think about that. You know, the day before the game, night morning of the game, uh, what outfit I'm gonna wear? Oh, man. Let's get that done. Well, shout out to Demar because I just ordered mine. Just came in the other day, so it's about time. Jake, if you could do it all over again, would you get the Q branded on your arm? 100. percent I'm thinking about getting another one. I got the one. On my, I got one on my chest, and I got yeah, the double hit right here. Oh yeah, I would for sure. Rome, step up. Well, if my, if you get double hit it, bro, again, I'll get one. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, what it got to do with me? Uh, it's for your I brother. I, I need somebody to hold my hand. All right, man. No, All I did, I did this one with no help. I ain't even nobody hold me. Just put a book right there and just <laughs> control, man. You got it, bro. 
It's okay. mental. Pain pain is mental. That it, is, it is mental, though. You're right. It is mental. It's, pain is mental. It's mental, bro. You're right. You've been through right. how many NFL training camps? You're trying to tell me you can't sit still? <laughs> how many shots and MRIs and all kinds of stuff you've <laughs> had? You can't sit still and get branded real quick? Hey, man, going to that male doctor is probably even worse, more mental than all of that. But uh, yeah. all right. Who is on your personal Mount Rushmore, Malcolm? Of what? Of just life. Life. Of life? Yeah. Who've influenced you, who Rushmore, made the wow. biggest impact in your life? How many's on Mount people. Four? You only get yeah, four, four. If you, in case you didn't know Mount Rushmore. Uh, yeah, I see. Um, uh, my, Mount, my Mount Rushmore would be um, Malcolm X, Jay-Z, Dave Chappelle, and uh, James Baldwin. Mm. Nice. Yeah. You're the first person that hasn't mentioned their mom or their dad. They're not on my Mount Rushmore. I get it. I get it. I'm just telling you the first one, bro. It's okay. It's okay. okay. Yeah, your answer. I actually is- really like yours more than everybody else's, actually, because it was yeah. like real people that we can look up to and like not touch. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. I actually appreciate that one more. Yeah, I like it. Like, I can hug my mama. I get it. I wish I would like that one. more about James Baldwin growing up as a kid. Yeah, I wish they would have taught what he stood for, what he said, his writing, like mm-hmm. just everything he was about. Mm-hmm. I wish I would have learned more about him as a kid in my youth than learning about him later in life as an adult. Now, I'm learning about him and I, I know who he is now, but I, I wish to God they would have taught about this man in high school or in junior high or elementary school because he has so much knowledge. Yeah, so much knowledge. And the, the problem was that in he's, you know, we talk about writers in general he's yeah. one of the you know greatest american writers of all time and and we are just getting to a place where we probably accept him on a broader basis simply because he was homosexual yeah right yeah. Like, so we yeah. took all of that that greatness kind of under the 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 rug um but i'm glad that that yeah, like you said more people are getting exposed to his writing and just what he meant even just for like the psyches of black folks the brother was brilliant Yes. All right, last question. Fill in the blank. Right now, my life is. Right now, uh, my life is an adventure. Football gives you so much structure. Every day they tell you where to go, what time yeah. the bus leaves, what time you eat, what time you rest. And now every day I wake up, I don't know what's coming. And it's right. like, and it's getting used to like being okay with that and, yeah. and then actually enjoying that part that like literally every day is something new to experience, is something new to learn um, and having to like embrace that. So there's no such thing as good, bad. Uh, it's just like, this is just what today was and mm-hmm. I'll get through it. And then tomorrow I just go at it again. And that, that part to me is like, is so uncomfortable. But if there's anything I learned while playing mm-hmm. balls, you got to get very comfortable being uncomfortable. No doubt. And Malcolm, you're a person that has always lived in the black and white and me have always in the gray. So I'm I'm, I'm enjoying hearing those words which from you. Which is not true anymore, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> now I'm like, you're more black and white and I'm probably the gray one of both of us. Like, right. there's really no, no right. I, but I love that growth in you, my bro. Yeah. You know, I love that. So um, I want to ask you one more thing, man. It's about your let foundation. Me, let, me let, on. Phone, let me let this phone stop ringing first. Oh, no, man, go ahead, brother. Because, you know, I don't have no control of it. No, no, you can't. That's what happens when you're man, hey, 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 you Malcolm Jenkins. You can do whatever you want to do, man. You can go over there and hang that phone up. Yeah, can y'all you stop can calling the school, please? You can be the principal. You can All do right. whatever you want to do. So, Mal, man, tell me about this, uh, your foundation event on Tuesday, November 29th. Yeah, so that's Giving Tuesday. Um, actually, like I said, I'm right here now at a Parkway Northwest High School in Philadelphia. It's one of the schools that we've adopted uh, mm-hmm. to do a lot of our work in, and we are building out these financial literacy programs that will roll out here, but also in a few other partner schools in North New Jersey, uh, in Newark specifically. Um, and this fundraiser that we're doing, um, the Fantasy Blitz, it's our fun- first fundraiser back in the city since I left uh, as an Eagle. So excited mm-hmm. to be back, but obviously we're gonna be doing things around fantasy football. It's kind of this game show host. The, the Eagles are flying high right now. So a lot of- Super high. 
Super high. So, you know, the biggest thing is just trying to get around, enjoying football, having some fun. There'll be a bunch of former and current Eagles that'll be in the building. Um, and we're raising money to build out these um, financial literacy programs that, again, I'm literally actively doing today. Just finished up one session. Uh, and we want to break this out to multiple schools. Um, and, and the only way we can do that is when we raise the funds and get the support from the community to actually build that infrastructure. That's what's up. Now I'm going to get you in trouble. Eagles Eagles or Saints? Pick one. I mean, you know, it just depends on what. You got to give me some context. I can't. It's just I can't hey, pick, one. <laughs> pick one. Eagles or Saints? I mean, I mean, if you're saying like, okay. Don't give me the political answer. Eagles or Saints? Don't. Eagles. That's it. Eagles or Saints? Eagles or Saints? But nah. I, nah my, I live in both cities. I, I live there. I have to lay my head there, so I can't just be saying crazy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, I think I think for me, I tell people all the time, like I cut my teeth in New Orleans, but like where I made myself as a player and man yeah. was in Philadelphia. That's what's so up. I'm, I'm a little bit more tied to Philly. I'm a, it's an hour away from home. Like yep. that is that is me. Like <laughs> that that place is me. But obviously, like I love New Orleans. Got a lot of history. Did two stints there. Yeah, they gave me a second second row, uh, go round when I I needed it. I yeah. went to go better myself. They were there for me. So, and I had the most fun probably the last two years. The last two years of my seat in my career were so unique for me. That I had so much fun just mm -hmm. playing the game of football. That like it's New Orleans, it's like it, I can't just make that to say just Philly and ignore New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Too much of an impression on me. You know what, Malk? I appreciate that. Um, I knew I was hoping you would say Philly because I remember when you went up there, you were like, bro, I was there the first 30 minutes. People were honking horns at me. I felt like I was back, baby. I was back in Jersey. Was people like, were yes. angry. It I was awesome. Get out of that, that Southern hospitality and everybody's being nice. I'm like, nah, I need a chip on my shoulder at all times. <laughs> well, look, man, keep that chip on your shoulder, bro. You've accomplished so many great things. You're a great dude, an awesome person, amazing leader. Anybody that wants to learn more about life, entrepreneurship, any of these things, go out there and follow this guy, Malcolm Jenkins. All you do is all you do is win, my brother. So I want to thank all the listeners for tuning in. Uh, I want to ask you guys to spread the word. Give us a rating, a review. I mean, make sure you be nice with that. And a follow on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your podcast. Thank you for listening. Hey, brother. Brother Jane, appreciate you, boss. Man, I appreciate both of y'all. I want all the listeners to understand, like, yo, y'all two, one, are just goats in the game like whether you even gave talk to me didn't like i just watched how y'all moved as individuals on the field off the field uh and y'all have affected an entire generation of players who've watched that so hats off to both of y'all appreciate y'all having me on for sure Appreciate you, boss appreciate him out the best thing Malcolm, is that i asked you about coming on my podcast a couple weeks ago like bro what are you talking about <laughs> 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 that's exactly it because that's all you say yo come on my podcast like what are you talking about bro i didn't know you had a podcast but here we are great appreciate you jank man all right baby i didn't even know i didn't even know you're gonna be on here i'm sitting outside i'm like i heard the computer i was like that roman <laughs> oh i should start looking at my schedule more often <laughs> all right y'all all right, all right bro. Bro. be good